Hi, welcome back everyone. Um, so I'll invite you guys in the back to come have a seat. Uh, we're going to talk about diversification strategies. So um, fill in and we'll get started again with our, our last session of the day. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, we're a little bit fewer than we were this morning, but, uh, but still going strong. So we're going to wrap up uh, our vision streams today with coming back to diversification, really more focusing on strategy and some tangible ways to push towards those visions. Uh, I'll call up our panelists. We have uh, Hugh Sutherland, uh, co-founder and director of Geomain. Uh, Dr. Anders Olsen, uh, Chief Commercial Officer of uh, eBox, and Salah Khan, uh, Coordinator of the Knowledge Center and Think Tank for the UPU. Um, so, uh, gentlemen, if you want to join me on stage, um, Hugh, in the nature of being uh, of innovation, disruption, diversification, is going to do things a little bit differently. Um, so, uh, Hugh, uh, I think that you're going to talk to us a little bit about how postal operators can play to their strengths, get close to existing customers, and attract new ones with their yeah. diversification strategies. That's correct. So good afternoon, everybody. I hadn't realized that this was the midnight shift. And uh, even though the drinks are on at 4 o'clock, it looks as if quite a number of people have disappeared that general direction already. But never mind, let's go on. Um, my name is Hugh Sutherland. I'm with uh, Geomain. And uh, I want to talk to you a bit about diversity. And my first example of diversity is that I've chosen to stand up here and not just follow the crowd and, and, and sit at the seat. Because diversity means a number of things. Um, in a traditional business sense, I thought when I was, when I was asked to uh, present today, Let's look at diversity. What does that mean? Why do organizations diversify? And there's no shortage of data on diversification strategies and risk, timing, new markets, new products, new products and new markets, having to do something different. You look at everybody from the Harvard Business Review to uh, business writers such as Arthur Little, but I chose just to look at the report that was published by the UPU hmm. just last month. And uh, let me just read it to you. The postal sector remains a critical element in the global ecosystem, transcending borders to connect people, <clears throat> businesses, and governments. It not only facilitates communication, but also serves as the backbone of digital trade logistics, and even economic resilience. However, the sector is grappling with a multitude of challenges from the lasting disruptions induced by global crises, such as COVID, to the transformative shifts in consumer behavior ushered in by the digital age. That would be the 22-year-old in Tanzania that wants to buy something from a marketplace and expects it to be delivered to his door, not to some P.O. box determined by somebody else 10 kilometers away. The report provides an exhaustive examination of the postal sector's existing landscape, challenges, innovations, and the potential avenues for future growth and resilience. Given these dynamics, the postal industry faces an unprecedented challenge in ensuring economic sustainability amid varying revenue streams, heightened competition, and inflationary pressures. The diversification of revenue alone may not suffice. Rather, a systemic integration of services is essential. E-commerce presents an exciting avenue. Well, if that isn't an understatement, I don't know what is. It requires the postal sector to innovate 
potentially through strate strategic collaborations with digital platforms and enhancing logistics capabilities. I think we've had a very interesting day. I think all of these points have been touched on. And I would, I would suggest that there's uh, agreement that the change must happen. And in the words of the song, the times, they are changing. So in terms of diversification, <clears throat> there's a management of that and, the, and risk. And whilst the, the opportunities within e-commerce are massive, and what's driving those? There's a, there's a whole new expectation. I, I think Dr. Fadi touched upon it earlier. It's not just about change for posts, it's change for logistics. The whole industry, our requirements and expectation of uh, newly emerging intelligent consumers that use these all the time to transact are perfectly comfortable using a digital platform to buy, pay, and hopefully have delivered items that they choose to purchase. It's absolutely essential that the, uh, the, the, the market moves with those expectations. So um, we know that, uh, assuming, assuming that postal operators wish to stay relevant and maintain or possibly enhance market share, gain the loyalty of a customer base, that sounds like a good thing, then is it not essential that some clear new thinking is required? This doesn't involve any artificial intelligence. This just involves basic intelligence, doesn't it? Is it not just keep it simple, stupid? Do you not need to know the basics about who your customers are? Is that not the fundamental thing that drives the business? KYC, know your client base. And what do we know about them today? Do we know their names? Do we know an address for them? What happens if they move? Do we have a postcode? What if we don't have a postcode? Where do we deliver to? Have they moved? All of these questions are, are I believe, things that are essential for us to be able to address more coherently and consistently. With a high degree of confidence that we will be able to supply a consistent service to the client base that is expecting more. So this notion of diversification, it's, it's absolutely essential. We've got to uh, deal with and, uh, and, uh, and, and address the requirement for change. <clears throat> in, the, in, in the report I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we acknowledge that um, traditional post has gone away, probably isn't gonna come back. People don't buy stamps anymore. We know that the parcels and logistics business is, is changing. Financial services is stable, but this fourth kind of catch-all that's mentioned in the report, generically called other services, that is where there's the potential to do more. And that's where the innovation can be. So, you know, there, there's, the, there's the discussion around re-engineering the business. Yep. There's a discussion around, uh, I mentioned artificial intelligence, there's other buzzwords, and blockchain, this and da, 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 da. I'd contend that just having the basic information about your client and being able to use that more consistently and to, and to enable you to offer better service is what it's all about. So it's dy dynamic data management. And um, the... Uh, Geomain really, when we, we came up with this idea four or five years ago, my goodness, what about the 70% of the population that don't have an address? Ooh. Where do we deliver to? Ooh. What are the expectations of the market? Uh, changing. So Geomain is essentially a digital identity and location management system. Wow. So I don't need to have an address. No, you don't. So if I describe where I live as the little hut somewhere down five miles down the track, turn left, turn right at the camel farm, I don't need to do that anymore. No, you don't. What if I move? That's okay. We move with you. Oh. And, and how can I get it? Well, if you think about the, the population that is expecting more of post, 
And if we acknowledge that Post is a service that is desperately seeking new sources of revenue, wouldn't it be really cool if the people that wanted such a service were buying it through the postal service? Hmm. Yeah. And wouldn't it be just like people buy domain names? Remember domain names? Or remember Yellow Pages, the way that we used to find companies, and now it's www. Why wouldn't you put a geographic expression on that for a company? Oh, and that's their geomain. Oh, and that's their unique, private, secure identity that will take you straight to the door. Hmm. That's what we do. And how do we do it? We do it with and through postal organizations. So, this is not dramatic change in terms of uh, infrastructure required. This is an easy to deploy, incremental value add system, drives more revenue, drives more opportunity, gets you more data on your customers and enables you to keep on growing the business and staying relevant. And I've gone over time and I'll sit down. But that's how we do it, simply taken, get rid of the names and addresses, replace it with one private code that is your name or your company name, and uh, off you go to the races. Instant digital identity allocation management. Thanks very much. Thank you, Hugh. Okay. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna move on and ask a couple of questions to, to our panelists here, and then we'll get into the discussion. Um, so Dr. Olson, what has been the driving factors behind the digitization of the postal sector in Denmark uh, specifically, and what kind of learnings uh, about diversification can you share with us here from there? So let me uh, pull up some slides. Just the clicker over there. Um, I'll go there. grab it. Um, so let me start by explaining what uh, eBox is. Uh, now, if I wanted to, uh, to use all of the uh, fancy lingo, I would probably say something like a two-sided uh, encrypted platform uh, with a closed loop ecosystem, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And if I wanted to actually have anyone understand what I was saying, I would say that it's a digital post box. And uh, the way it works is that I have to approve which senders can send something to me and the senders have to know who I am, so they need to know when a unique identifier to send something to me. So this means I don't have spam, I don't have uh, phishing attempts, etc., etc. I can trust what's there. What is there is only important information that I want. Uh, it's stuff that I can sign electronically, I can pay electronically, etc. So with that, just a little bit of background on uh, on eBox and, and who we are, and I'll get into uh, the story about Denmark and, and why it maybe started there. So we're owned partly by PostNord, the, uh, the designated operator in Denmark and Sweden, and a pan-European uh, service provider called uh, Nets and Nexi. And we've been doing this for uh, a bit over 20 years. Uh, we've got 21, uh, 23 million uh, users uh, globally. Uh, more than 30,000 institutions use us to send uh, whether that's public or private, uh, documents, etc., to their users. So last year that meant roughly half a billion uh, documents went through our platform, and we've got something like five and a half billion on, on file, right? So we do this in a couple of different ways. We have a branded platform in, in the Nordics where we are eBox as a brand, and we have all of the senders on one side, all of the users on one side. We sell the product and services to the senders, and we manage the users, and then we do a white label solution that we can deploy. So if you, as a postal operator, would want to do this, we can deliver this as a service. Uh, we can have you up and running uh, fairly quickly, and you can build this into part of your, uh, your business model. So on the user side, uh, this is a great way to have sort of a lifelong digital vault, uh, all of the important information I want. It's safe from cybercrime, etc. I can sign things, it's super convenient to pay. For senders, of course, uh, not only do they have less cost, because we are quite a lot cheaper than physical mail, but the fact that you send data out and get data back instead of sending something out to a physical document and getting a physical document that you need to then plug into your uh, internal systems, this makes your internal processes much more efficient, right? And so there's regulatory compliance. We actually see people have much, much higher opening rates. Uh, I think they're above 
86% in, in our system, whereas if you take an email, that's clearly a lot lower. Plenty of uh, ESG impacts at a societal level, and of course, importantly for the postal operators, what we see is that this becomes an interesting way to uh, change the declining curve uh, of revenue on mail uh, and, and actually start bringing this in as a revenue source. So it's a way to keep your position in society um, and actually start making some money off the digitization. So as I said, let's look at the Danish case. There's some elements there that, that are important to, to learn from, I think. Um, of course, this all started because there was a good case in place. So we had, uh, uh, of course, cost drivers uh, from the public and private sector pushing to, uh, to, to reduce costs. But we also have citizens with a high digital readiness. Uh, we had infrastructure in place, so internet access, uh, electronic IDs, etc. And of course, users early on in Denmark expected that we would digitize uh, something like this. And I think this might have been uniquely Danish back in 2000 and something, but probably in most societies these things are starting to be in place, so it, it's starting to be much easier to do this. We then had a mandated, uh, uh, or we had a law change, so it was mandatory to get your government mail as digital, unless you opted out. Of course, that meant that the curve on physical mail declined quicker than maybe it otherwise would. Uh, but what was key, I think, for uh, PostNor was to be in the driving seat once that decline started. So what I'm showing you here is basically what happened to the physical mail volume in Denmark and what's happened to the digital mail volume in Denmark. So basically, I think it tells its own story. But the, the important part of the story is this is a very uh, steep decline. Of course, that's driven by the 2014 uh, change in law. So you had to send digitally as a government institution. Now, that might not happen in all countries. Uh, and, and so the point is, it will probably have some decline in all countries. Uh, so if we look at it uh, at a European level, this is not a Danish phenomenon. Volume is declining. And I think the question is then, can you either soften that curve or can you make sure that you make money off it uh, by uh, building new revenue streams? We think we've got something that can help postal companies do that. We think what's important to understand when you want to do these uh, types of diversifications is that you keep doing what you're great at. Um, so the obvious player to take the role of the operator of these digital uh, postbox platforms, we think are, of course, the postal operators. We do see uh, governments uh, wanting to do it. We do see some telcos wanting to try and take that position. But as a postal operator, that position you have in the ecosystem, the trust you have on both sides of the platform, the insights you have about the users, uh, as well as the senders of, uh, of mail, is quite unique. Uh, so the ability to service them, to sell to them, no one is better positioned uh, than, than you guys to do that. On the other hand, not a lot of postal operators are tech companies. So it's often a bit of a leap to think we can develop this whole platform ourselves. Uh, I think we all know the pains of a failed IT project and uh, the costs of that. So I think the point from, uh, from our side is it's probably better to partner to get those capabilities. I think we've heard that earlier in the day as well, that that's probably the way to go. We very much uh, support that. Um, and so just wanted to wrap up and say what are some of the key learnings that, uh, that we see from the Danish market in terms of how do you try and, uh, and diversify and what's an effective way to do it. So. First off, I think it, it's clear that regulatory change is going to happen. We'll now have a disbandment of the USO in Denmark. So again, maybe a bit on the forefront of regulation, but it most likely will come uh, in, in different shades in different countries. Um, it probably is mainly about, do you want to be in the driving seat, A, in pushing the regulation where you want it, but also in terms of controlling the decline and the pace of that decline and what you get uh, as a replacement. Again, focusing what you do great is, is always a good idea, and especially if you want to do effective partnerships. Uh, figure out how do you integrate something that works with your business model. So what we do is, if you think about it, not that different from sending a physical letter. It's now just in a digital format. So it complements the business model perfectly right. You do need a mind shift change in the organization, uh, in, in your individuals, but it's still something you can do without a uh, huge disruption to the business model. I think then importantly, and this probably goes for most diversification ventures, right? If you're not willing to cannibalize on what you already do, 
then you probably won't succeed uh, at, at real scale. I think there needs to be an acceptance that a lot of new things, or new uh, diversification ventures, do entail some degree of cannibalization, at least from the perspective where we sit. And doing it too slow uh, means that others will probably take pole position in the market you're in, and then getting back on track can be quite difficult. And similar to that, uh, the platform uh, dynamics of what we do, uh, we see in Denmark where we've now had a competitor enter a couple of years ago. Uh, I think they have 4% of the market or something like that. It is super hard to, uh, to enter once there's an established platform. So if you are ready to go all the way and become that platform, you secure yourself a very strong position. Instead of going slow and maybe be entering a very fragmented market where it's hard to build any kind of win or where you just build pockets of wins and then becoming that ecosystem really connector is hard if you have such a fragmented market. So we think the point is to go uh, ahead of time and to make sure you shape what's happening in, the, in your market. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Um, Salah, so we've heard some concrete examples of uh, new products and services of an approach to diversification with digital post offices, digital identities, and, uh, and digital locations. Can you talk to us more from a global perspective and um, where does the UPU see new postal revenues emerging and what are some strategies that Post can do to, to diversify? Thank you for the question, Amanda. Um, let me just set the scene a bit about how and where we see things from the UPU as an intergovernmental institution with 192 member countries. It's very interesting for us to see the diversification in, in products and services that takes place in specific markets. And what we know for a fact is that there isn't a single strategy for new markets. Um, if you look at the past two reports we've produced, the State of the Postal Sector report this year and the one last year, we do what is known as a postal development level classification. That's essentially a um, proxy for the maturity of a post to provide services. Um, and we rank countries according to 10 PDLOs, as we call them. Ideally, we would like to see a bell curve. So a or we would write, like to see a right skewed curve where everyone's on the high end of the scale, everyone's mature, they can do a number of things. Um, unfortunately, we see a left skewed curve, which means that most or the bulk of our member countries are at a lower postal development scale, meaning that they are, and with all my apologies, struggling to provide core services. That is, that is what the graph tells us um, for all intents and purposes. Now, for us to talk about diversification strategies, we, we cannot come in and say X or Y, simply because that our diversification strategies has to come from the market based on the nuances of the regulations, the demand and the conditions in, in specific countries and territories. But what we do see is the global big picture. And this graph, well, these two graphs, will tell you two different pictures. First of all, the growth in real operating revenue, while it fell in the 2010 to 2015 period, has largely recovered, and we expect it to be not really declining significantly, but stagnant. This tells us the size of the pie globally, whether the pie is growing or that the pie is decreasing. While it was an issue, I think postal operators are clawing back at the market. That's, that's what we're seeing from a net operating revenue um, growth perspective. Second one is really about growth, and, and it's about taking a, a specific dollar value and seeing that you know, even if there are fluctuations, overarchingly, the market is growing. And this one actually breaks down the revenue into four segments as we see them, letters, parcels, financial services, and as you had pointed out, other postal services into which we lump everything else. Now, letter post, no surprise to anybody, is rapidly declining. And our forecast for the next couple of years is that it will keep on declining. So in terms of revenue diversification, if you consider that letter post was the bulk of the work that was happening in the post, this is ringing alarm bells everywhere. And, and at the UP, we are ringing as loud an alarm bell as we can around this. Parcel post is picking up, and it will. The forecast is it will grow in the next couple of years. But realistically, it's not providing the substitution that you need in terms of or offsetting the loss from letter post. So you then need to look at 
financial services and other postal services. And financial services fluctuates, but it's going to remain steady. Now, the only nuance that I would put in here is that financial services are heavily regulation dependent. So in certain markets, it's growing very high. Certain markets is declining because of regulatory requirements. Certain markets are completely dark because they cannot do anything with financial service. So this is a bit tricky, this one. And for other products, philately renting out space, doing other things, it's largely dec declining, which is not necessarily a bad thing because for us, we see it as a post going back to its core strengths. That means they've stopped experimenting with other things and they think that core postal logistics however you want to do it, might be the future for them. So that's, that's, that's an interesting nuance that we're looking at. And over the next course of the next couple of years, we will be seeing how this tracks out and whether this holds, or whether we will see a spike in other postal services and, and we see that, okay, maybe not. People are going to be experimenting with other things and, and doing um, other services than core postal logistics. Now, throughout the entire day, I kept hearing, what is the UPU doing? And, and that, that was quite interesting for us. And, and, you know, the question remains, how do you diversify your revenue? So I'm going to offer up three key factors to look at. And, 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 and it's a bit of a time-gated process. Um, diversification, and, I, and I'm going to nuance this and preface this with two thoughts. Diversification is not a here and now and I'm done and over with process. It's a long-term thing, right? So you, you need to really look at the short, medium, and long-term when you're talking about diversifying products and services. That's one. And two, just don't jump into it. You need to have a strategic view as to what you want to do. I mean, doing this today and doing that tomorrow is probably very harmful. So if we do look at the three main elements that we are, we are going to be looking at in, in, in terms of diversifying products and services, first one absolutely is getting your fundamentals right. Get your po core postal logistics right. Get your service levels right. Get your delivery times right. Get your uh, reliability high. Um, get your reach high. All the core metrics that, that defines the quality of service for a post. And in that, that level, um, enhanced customer experience, as we said, improvement of quality of services, and demand responsive. Um, like Anders is saying, there is clearly a demand for this kind of services in Denmark. But it might not be the same in some other territory, some of the country. So, you know, just because it's superbly successful in Denmark doesn't mean you just take the same model and try to replicate it, I don't know, in, in Bangladesh, where I come from. It, it would not work. It, it simply won't work. So understand your market, understand your demand, and, and focus on where the demand is, where the market is going. And, and if you can create the demand, like with the change in regulations, with regulatory innovations, with changes in the market structure, do it. But if you don't see that these things are going to happen, then do not invest in, 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 in a market diversification project that, that will not bear fruits for you. And in that sense, the UPU does a fantastic amount of work in improving the quality of service and the basic quality of service of, of all our postal operators day in, day out. That's what we support with. Core postal logistics improvement, that's what the UPU does. We have entire divisions where people are working on it every day. The second one is the peer learning. And we talked about this a lot in the morning in, in the vision setting. Thing. We want to learn from best practices. We want to see what the pitfalls are. We want to see where they went wrong and avoid doing that. We want to learn from the UPU what is going on in the market, what's upcoming. We want to learn and see and gather the knowledge that's already out there. And that's what we're doing day in, day out through our research, through our advocacy, through peer-based knowledge platforms that we have. We have multiple discussions, webinars. We have our structured um, sessions where we expose all of our membership, and everyone is welcome to this, on learnings both from the private sector as well as from operators. So we do bring in private sector experiences and we showcase that to our membership and say these are learnings that you can look at and, and think about. And we also do um, technical assistance. So we have significant amount of technical assistance that we provide both, uh, I mean, I come from um, the part of the UP where we provide technical assistance significantly on financial inclusion. Um, and there's similar work happening on strengthening core postal logistics and operations. So we do provide a significant amount of technical assistance. The knowledge sharing um, part is heavily in demand, but we suffer a bit from it, given that there is a lack of support behind it. But it's something that we're trying to overcome and, and we're trying to really gear that up to move forward. And the last one is using the postal advantage. What we know 
um, from our research is that Pulse is a trusted institution in almost all the countries around the world. So use the Pulse brand, leverage it, do what you do best, develop your services, grow and provide additional services that your clients really want. But you need to get your basics right. You need to be that trusted provider in the communities. The man or woman who goes to the remote rural village where there's no ATM, there's no bank, there's no person, there's only a post person who goes there and leverage that trust and that experience in expanding into other services that's actually required by this community. Don't feed it to them, see what they want, provide it to them. And then, you know, in terms of what we are seeing the greatest amount of growth in, 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 in um, services, it's probably um, citizen-centric services, digital identity, GDP payments, pension services, um, you know, all of these things that is required by the government. And, and interestingly, inside our, our, our house, we are talking about taking a whole of a government approach towards postal solutions, meaning you don't just do letters, you don't just do e-commerce, you are the engine that provides solutions to everything that is bothering your government. If your government wants a, a um, solution that needs to be developed and provided to your um, city during COVID, the post provided, you know, um, vac apart from vaccine delivery, which required specific um, cold chain, PPE equipment, medical supplies, everything, that, even blood transfers from one place to another. The post, you have a challenge, the post has a network, the post has a solution, can they do it? So that's really where we are. We think the diversification strategy needs to focus on. Great, thank you. I would just follow up with that, with the citizen services. Um, what is what is your team working on to, to help facilitate that for post, for best practices? You mentioned that there's all these webinars and tools available, but if, if you could talk a little bit more about best practices and citizen so, services. So um, in terms of best practices dissemination, our role at a global level is capturing what is happening in the markets, distilling them into specific knowledge that can be used by our membership and disseminating them. So in that sense, we have a postal um, social services guide, which has come out and, and it's on the UP website. We keep updating it, we keep refreshing it and, and really captures a body of knowledge around what the post is providing in terms of postal social services. This, we are doing similar things with financial services where we're trying to capture our lessons learned of providing technical assistance in nearly 30 countries around the world. And some of them really setting the postal financial services strategy for the country. What have we learned from that? What can we take? What can we distill into it? What can we bring to our membership? And these we disseminate both via webinars and, and discussion with the membership. We make presentations in front of our councils so that our, our entire council and membership is aware of it. And, and we have the research reports, which is open, publicly available, it's global public good, anybody can come to our website, come and download it. I mean, the State of the Postal Security Report that we just published right now talks heavily about hyper collaboration in the postal sector. So it's moving beyond traditional partners into areas where you might not think they would be your traditional postal partners, but they would bring tremendous values into the, into the system. So this hyper collaboration concept, along with AI, is something we've broached in the latest report, and, and that is, Again, open to our membership. We are going to talk about it in our upcoming council meeting. We are going to um, go into a heavy advocacy campaign for all of our membership. Make sure they understand our messages. Wonderful, thank you. Hugh, uh, talking about uh, government services and citizen services, uh, the first thing I thought about was this digital identity. Is this something that, that you're working with Post and, and their governments in tandem with to, to create something that's streamlined, not just something that's, uh, that you get through the postal service, but a I, digital ID that you can also use for government services? Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that, you know, there's, Every government is looking for a better and more consistent and easy way to interact with their populace. And, and having a national identity is, is kind of fundamental. And some of these national identities, in, in the UK it could be a national insurance number. The UK is very resistant to some kind of national ID. But having lived in Singapore and in Hong Kong for a number of years, it's a matter of course. You know, these, these are systems that are used for everything. For trade, for opening a bank account, validation, everything. And so we believe that um, being able to have an, an easy to adopt digital identity system linked to location, hmm, that brings another whole new dimension to it. And it's, it's valid not just for postal operators, but for anybody that cares about location. It's ride hailing, it's food delivery, it's logistics of any type. And, and 
let's just assume that is also an authenticated digital ID. It's an identity that, that, that can't be copied, it can't be stolen. And so suddenly you're on the basis of taking a leap from having an old paper-based system or no system into one that can be easily adopted uh, to other perhaps existing systems which use a nature of, of digits or numbers that are purely used within the borders. But to make that identity international, combine it with Geomain. Or to make a Geomain useful to other government agencies in country and internationally, combine it with, uh, with other existing systems. So it's, it's pretty dynamic. And uh, we, we, we think from the level of interest that we're getting from many different departments in, in different countries that we, we have identified something that is really special. And what kind of infrastructure, what do uh, these kind of partners have to do on their back end to implement something like this? Well, that's the beauty of it, because <clears throat> it's, not, uh, it's not reinventing the wheel. I think it's fair to say that uh, every government agency has probably, well, judging from the numbers I've seen today, firstly, let's look at digital adoption. And the numbers I've seen today, um, generally 70 plus percent of populations have got access to something. That's pretty good, right? So there's, there's, the assumption is that there's a digital backbone. I think that's fair. And, and if, if there's not, there's an acceptance that there's a direct correlation between having a digital backbone and sustainability and, and economic growth, right? So that's, that's the baseline. The, the second is um, you then want, you, you want to be able to ensure that this thing that sounds quite exciting is le easily available. And if it was purchased through postal organizations, let's assume they just have an internet connection and the ability to capture basic details about that individual. That's pretty much it. And my <coughs> co-founder, who came up with all of this brilliance, is sitting in the audience, and he'll come and slap me on the side of the head if I've said anything inaccurate. But when we have been working with government agencies and we do the study, we go through a process of identifying current environment and 2B uh, environment, then we haven't, we've yet to find any environment that poses great difficulty to us. Uh, any environment that we believe uh, requires a significant investment. So it's easy to install, easy to get active, easy to get results. Thank you. Um, Anders, so I, I'm curious about this market for a digital post uh, box in, in Denmark. Can you tell us a little bit about the kind of customers that you're working with that are interested in using this solution uh, for their base over email and, and why they choose it and what that what those uh, customers look like or what kind of customers those are? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned before, the whole public sector went digital. So of course, uh, the public sector is a bit a big uh, sender base, but we uh, we see uh, banks, insurance companies, utilities, uh, you know, any kind of, of sender you could imagine uh, right down to even the local uh, uh, craftsman who wants to send his invoice in a place where he can document, well, you got the invoice at this point in time, it was easy for you to pay it and you didn't, so now here's a late fee. Yeah. So, so the use cases are, are quite a lot uh, and, and the segments can be anything you could imagine from utilities to healthcare, uh, etc. The, the key, I think, is to think of this as not just digitizing and killing off physical mail, uh, and the senders typically don't want that either. So uh, I, I always hear the notion that all senders just want cheap, uh, cheap stamps, right? And that's what's killing everything. But essentially, they want a job done. So they want their customers to open a piece of communication, uh, respond, maybe provide sensitive information in the other direction, sign something, pay something, read and understand something. And what's the best way to get that done? That might be still physical mail in some instances for some uh, receivers who might be too old to have digitized. And in some instances, it'll be uh, something like a digital mail solution. It could also be an email is sufficient. It could be text messages. And I think for, for the postal operators to think of themselves as, as multi-channel rather than just physical mail is really the key here. And it, it, it could be a digital post box. It could probably be many things. We've seen this works really well. 
uh, because it, it offers senders uh, the opening rates that, they, that they're looking for. It provides them with the evidence that this was received at this point in time. It was opened. It was open for this long, so you probably read and understood it. Uh, it's been signed. It's been paid. Uh, whatever sender uh, has in terms of preferences for the signing, digital signing provider, uh, digital payment provider, they can use that. We have an API-based system that is agnostic. So we can really focus on the senders and say, what is it you have that you want solved? What's your problem? And let's figure out the right way to do it. Great. Um, when you mentioned health um, healthcare companies or healthcare providers using something like this, uh, it makes me think of some products that Post have experimented with, with having a, a place where someone can hold all of their medical records. And uh, you explained it as a two-way system. So someone is sending me my medical records, maybe, or maybe I send something back. But uh, is there any are there any ideas about expanding this to where it can kind of be a repository for that kind of critical information that multiple people can plug into with, of course, secure access and granted permissions and these things? Sure. I think at its core, this is what it is, right? It's, it's a lifelong digital vault of all of the important uh, information, whether that's regarding my home, my kids, my uh, finances, my health. I can store it here. I can have different, you know, you can have folder structure. You can have different universes where you store different things and you can grant access, right? So if I want to take out a new car loan, then my bank could ask me for access to my five latest uh, payslips, my tax report from the year before, whatever they would need to uh, assess that loan uh, application, right? I wouldn't have to go to 10 different systems and download it and scan my latest payslip and send it through. I grant them access. You can access these documents. You can do that for the next two days and then close that off again. So again, that makes the, the bank's internal credit assessment processes are way more efficient they aren't at risk of receiving an email and then putting it somewhere in a folder and it's not allowed to sit there. So now they're breaching GDPR regulations. They just have the access they need for the time they need. And they know that information is verified. It is the actual payslip. It is the actual tax report. Um, so uh, so we, we, we think more and more from having just done digitization of physical post, moving into self-service so I can share information, I can fill in forms, I can do all these payments and signings and all of these different things. And then sort of the next level is way more data driven and way more into depth with the sender systems and understanding what is it, what do your critical processes look like and how does all of the information we now have on all of these different citizens help you become more efficient and operate better? And how do we help you tailor what you want to send to your senders? So I think the next frontier is probably something like AI. So if I'm a company, I want to communicate to 100 customers or a million customers, we can help you eventually, once we get there, understand. So these 100,000 customers, they need the header to be this. Uh, they need the text to be structured like this. Uh, and they need to receive it on Tuesday morning because that's when uh, this person is having his morning coffee and he's willing to, to send, uh, put a signature on it, right? And then send us that unified uh, uh, document with the core information and you can then tailor that to those different segments and send it out there and get those response rates and, and that engagement you want. Interesting. Yeah, uh, uh, this clicks with me with having to apply for residency in a couple of different countries and all of the official documents I needed and I can relate to the this problem that you're solving um, there. So uh, before I dive into more questions, I just want to make a scan. Yeah, Kate. Thank you, Kate Muth from IMAG. Um, a question. So I know with the digit moving to digital and, you know, especially with the EBOC, as I'm understanding it, you're inviting that uh, relationship with a trusted partner. But I wonder if, and this is for all of the panelists, if there comes a t point where the digital communication reaches what some in the world call junk mail, right? Where you now, I, I've got this relationship, but in addition to getting my bank statement, now they're sending me a bunch of um, marketing communications and we see this in the US in particular when you give to a charity or a nonprofit you 10 minutes later they're asking for more money and so you know you have to create up and create an entire separate email just for or you order something online and you're just bombarded with with emails so I'm wondering if there is going to be this point where the digital communication 
is dealing with what the postal world dealt with for many years, which is that advertising mail is maybe unwelcome. But the value proposition is different in, in the postal system because there's a, there's a higher price to send that piece. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. So I, I'm happy to start uh, and uh, I'll make sure to leave some time for the other guys. But I think from our perspective, that's why email is not a very efficient tool to communicate important information because you get so much clutter in your Gmail account that I don't know what to trust. I hardly bother scrolling through the 50 new messages uh, or emails I get every day because there's so much garbage I don't want. So in a closed loop ecosystem, I only get the stuff that I've requested from the senders that I want to send to me. So I know that what's in there is something important that I need to read and that I need to relate to. So so yep. So so that that of course that's up to the individual operator, right? So in 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 the case of ebooks, we've said there's no marketing going on here. So you don't send uh, the latest uh, newsletter with uh, offers on candy or whatever, right? You you send the important information, and the senders understand this as well, right? Because they also understand that if they start sending through advertisements, it will devaluate the value of the channel that you're using. Users will opt out of getting stuff from them because just as you can say these guys can send to me, you can also say this guy can't send to me anymore. So he's now back to physical mail, which is super expensive compared to this and an inefficient channel. So you, you regulate that and, and you avoid those kinds of, uh, of situations. Yes, I, I think um, <clears throat> as a further uh, extension of an authenticated, validated, private, secure system, then uh, you want to ensure that you're, let's just get rid of email actually. I think, I think the time for email has passed, and I think the time for passwords and having to constantly remember them with the little stickers around your screen or whichever way, we're, we should be over this. And surely the, the, the way that we've got to now is that we're just putting sticking plasters on top of authentication and validation solutions. So let's look at it a different way, and that's, that's, uh, that's what we're doing um, in, the, in the geomain world and uh, looking at having the validated identity, um, keeping that in a closed loop and ensuring that uh, the old ways, which have turned out just to be a nightmare, emails and passwords, let's do it differently. And that's, that's where we're happy to engage with people and, and talk about where we see things going. It's a little trickier for us to comment on this. This is a, this is a rights issue. You have the right to send mail, you have the right to receive mail, you have the right to opt out. Um, so for us, I can't see a regulation saying you can't send a newsletter by post. Um, by de facto extension, that doesn't apply to digital items. But what we would say is, with, within the rights of a citizen, you must have the right to opt out. You, you have the right to privacy. You have the right to not be bombarded when you do not want to be. Um, you have the right to keep your own information confidential. Those must be respected. And, and under no circumstances, at least in my own, own opinion, should someone step in and say, you do not have the right to send this. Right? I mean, this, these are still businesses that are trying to do business. A charity, with all my apologies to the charity, is simply trying to get money, arguably for a good cause. Um, it, it, it might be a bother to me, it might work for somebody else, but the charity must have thought this through before sending it out. So for us, it's about saying, yeah. you can do it, that's fine, just make sure the person can opt out yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and not do this. Yes, of course, I, I, I don't wish to say, let's get rid of emails. Yeah, exactly. I, didn't, I didn't mean that. <laughs> and, and it's very tricky for us to say yeah. what can go through our yeah. channels. It's about, it, it's, it's about making sure that you respect the rights yes. of everybody, both sides, sure. both, both, both um, parties involved. It, it's affecting a better way of communication that doesn't, doesn't give you a full inbox. Correct. That's, that's really what we're talking about. And so echoing that, uh, to me, if someone uh, came up with the brilliant idea of having part of our platform be an advertisement area, so saying, well, you know, so I'm into electronics. If I opt in and say I want, I want advertisements yeah. for electronics and a coupon and or whatever that might be, that's fine. That can sit over here. Over here is still my sort of my secure, trusted uh, mail that I receive. I don't mix those two. 
I have a separate part of the universe which is reserved for sort of those more advertisements or commercial things, I'd be fine with that. What I don't want is uh, next to my insurance uh, policy is an advertisement for a new iPad or whatever. So, so I want to make sure that it's clear where's, where's what and that the individual has the right to choose, yes, I want it or no, I don't want it. I think... I mean, we see this a bit in Gmail, right? That you have a promotions tab, but that's not working very well. Uh, it's still there and it's still something that you know, causes an extra stress in your day-to-day -day life to have to, to see it, deal with it, even if it's not in line with your other emails. So I think it would be tricky navigating um, that part of things, but but you're not doing that yet, right? With uh, any advertising? No, no, we're not. Yeah. I mean, it's something we've thought about. We get often we get asked this, uh, both from postal companies that are interested in, in adopting our solution, but also senders that, of course, are interested in potentially promoting products. Mm -hmm. And we've so far, it's been a hard no. But but I do, I am open to exploring the idea that if if we can separate the two very clearly, then that might be an avenue to go. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't see the case yet where we would do it, but if, again, if that's what the uh, end user wants, yeah. then I think that's what we should listen to, just as we should listen to what the sender wants. And when we get to the point where both sides are saying, we actually would like to communicate about uh, advertisements, then, okay, here's a safe space where you can do that. It'll be what you want to communicate, and then yeah. you know, let, let you guys do that. Yeah. Uh, Hugh and Anders, you're both uh, providing products and services that are still very close to the co uh, postal business. Um, they're new products and services, but they're, they're close to the core. Um, and Sala, maybe you can join in on this one as well. Um, what kind of, uh, what's the best balance that organizations can take when it comes to diversifying their revenue streams and staying close to the core or, or doing something completely different? Um, does it have to be one or the other? Because I think if you're, if you're staying close to the core, it's really hard to think outside of that. Um, and th should they be separate? Should they be together? Should they be considering both? Uh, let me know what you think about that. Well, I, I, I think the, the core for us, the core for any, any operator would be um, having accurate current data about your client base. And we talk to so many uh, uh, countries, so many geographies where it's, it, 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 uh, the, the best they have for a client is a PO box. Or the best they have is some descriptor that's a generic village somewhere or other. And um, that, that may have been good enough, but I don't think it is good enough now. And that it's essential, that, because the market has changed completely. Anybody sub-25, as, as I mentioned, I pulled out my phone, they want the stuff delivered to their door. And so surely the first step is to be able to give them the opportunity of sharing where they are in a clear, concise manner that is meaningful to them, that is not some hybrid group of words that randomly push together that change every few meters, right? That doesn't make any sense. But being able to have an identity that is yours, that is secure, private, that you can share via QR code, you can describe and by with the addition of audio or text or photographs, so that there's no lack of clarity. Is that surely not the basis for any operator, do they not want to have that data? And once they've got it, and if a business wants to do the same, is there not the opportunity to let that business have a geographic locator the same way that they use a domain name today to identify their brand, but have that with a geographic spin? And for the operator to get new revenue streams for having the company come to them to register that name. I mean, that's the, to me, that's the basics. Get, keep, get the data that you don't currently have get greater loyalty from this customer base who trusts you, right? They've been doing business with the post office for 50 years. They want to do more business. They want to make sure there's relevant business that caters for their requirements today. So the first thing is get closer to them, understand their requirements, provide, encourage them to provide you with the data and to the, to the benefit of all, and maybe through the marketplaces, offer a discount for them getting, providing this data get rid of the return rates, increase the accuracy of deliveries, and use it as the basis of, of inclusion in society and being able to share selectively that data with other government agencies. 
So keep it simple, stupid. It's not artificial intelligence. It's real intelligence. Know your clients. Okay. I think we have a question, but did you guys have anything to follow up on that, on keeping yeah, so, um, close From to the a core? diversification point of view, I, I, I think it's, it's not either or, it's and. Um, it's not core business or diversify. It's if you, if you do not have your core business and your strength built up and you continually continue to build up, what are you diversifying into? I mean, the, the post isn't going to turn into a clinic. It, it will still be a core logistic provider. So building on that, you diversify into your areas of strength where you have a physical network that's already deployed in, in areas where nobody else has that strength and you diversify into it. And there's a certain linearity to it, meaning if you don't do your core business of postal logistics properly, no one's going to take your diversified services, I'm sorry. That's right. right? There's a, there, there, it's and, and a linear pro pathway, which doesn't mean you just sit around and you say, oh, well, do it one day when everything's fine and the rain has stopped. But it, it's, again, going back to some of the things that we're talking about, that you need to start thinking about these strategies early on, and these are long-term pathways. And while you're thinking of these long-term pathways and what's existing out in the market and what you can do, you need to continually improve your core set of business to ensure that your customer footprint is expanded, people come coming back to you, as you were saying, you, the people trust you, and you are a trusted provider who can then branch out into other things. And then people will come, financial services, for example. If they don't trust you, why will they give you your money? But that trust comes from doing what you are supposed to do, fantastic and above board. I would say that the issue of trust is very interesting because in the postal world, we talk about this a lot, the trust of the postal service as an institution. But if I think of my friend's kids that are teenagers and they really don't have an opinion about the postal service. So how, how do you carry this? Um, yeah? yeah. Okay. You want to talk about we that? We actually have a publication on this. Okay. It's <laughs> <Great. laughs> on our website. Great. How to build trust in the postal ecosystem to, uh, it, it was actually around the financial services area. Um, it is true that we are, maybe the younger generation are not really aware of the post. It, w when I started, my first bank account was with the post. You know, our parents was the same thing. You know, um, postal bonds was a big thing for us, that, where you put your savings in. So there was a lot of, Maybe it was because of a lack of fragmentation and choices in the market. Markets have evolved. People's needs have evolved. Um, demands have evolved. Tastes have evolved. All of that has evolved. But then that comes back to the point as to whether you're being market appropriate and demand sensitive. Because markets will always change. The younger generation, just to bring you a point, if you're in Switzerland and you're 16 years old, the only place where you have a right to an account is Swiss Post, Post Finance. Uh, um, and as a foreigner, if I walk into a branch of Credit Suisse or UBS, they won't give me an account, Swiss Post Bill, Post, um, post Finance Bill. That's part of the stuff that's enshrined into the system. So, you know, in, in, the, in the post financial services world, we started talking about an universal financial obligation, like the USO, where you say everyone ought to have a right to a postal bank account. Might not be super fancy, but Somebody is a young person and needs a basic debit card and an account to keep her his or her savings in. Why not? Post can provide that. So just adding, I think part of, of retaining that trust and that position in the ecosystem is, of course, about solving the problems that they might have. And if you're 17, 18 years old, then I'm not sure a physical letter feels like something that really solves a problem. Maybe it's more bother than it's actually something you want. So understanding what is it that you can do for them to make sure that you remain relevant and, and deliver some kind of value for them, that will then build that trust, I think, is, is, is where you want to look. So, you know, we're a generation that's grown up with the post being the ones that delivered the information you really required. They were the one that delivered parcels and whatnot. And now uh, there's such an array of different offerings, uh, digital and uh, physical, in, in all kinds of ways that this generation will be exposed to all of it. And if you don't show why should they trust you, mm -hmm. because you understand them and you deliver what they need, then I don't think it's a given that they will trust you, right? And just to add to Anders' comment, I, I think you touched upon a very important point here. I think if you break it down from a consumer service point of view, trust is about meeting a demand in a reliable manner consistently. Mm -hmm. 
So it's about identifying that need. Again, it comes back mm -hmm. to the services diversity. What is the need of this customer group? Have we identified what the needs are? Have we distinguished them as a distinct customer base that has distinctive needs? Mm -hmm. And can we offer that whatever the service is, I mean, it's not letter, it can be something else. It, it, can, be, um, it can be online shopping and, and reverse logistics. Are we meeting that consistently in a reliable manner? And that's what builds trust. Demand um, uh, focused, reliable. Great, thank you. I think we have a question. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. My name is Walter Trezek. I'm the chairman of the consultative committee of the UPU. Um, my question is very direct. Um, the UPU created more or less 20, uh, sorry, two decades ago, an environment uh, of very trusted digital communication dot post. The UPU created standards for secured communication, um, a standard, a seal standard um, for electronic certified postal marks. They created a standard for postal registered email, a highly secured way to send email, postal registered email. Um, was that too early? Um, what happened to that? Why? didn't it take off, or it took off, but only in one European country, Denmark, um, what went wrong? Thank you. Is that scared me of the wrong person to ask this? Uh, I mean, this is so technical, Walter, you have to talk to Lati, who's sitting two rows in front of you. Um, UPU's mandate is to set standards and interoperable mechanisms to promote cross-border exchange of items, whether it's letters or parcels. If these systems were created, they were born out of a demand from our member states. These are rarely or never done in a vacuum by the UPU. Now, whether these services had, had taken off or whether there was a shortcoming in the system that needs to be developed, whether there's an advocacy or an awareness or of, of policymakers and or operators that needs to be done, certainly something that can be looked at. But I can assure you that if these were created two decades ago, at that point of time, there was significant sufficient demand for such products and services and standards that necessitated the UPU to actually create these. Now, nothing prevents us from going back and do a diagnostic of it. And, and we do that all the time. We do diagnostic of systems to keep them reliable, efficient, and updated with modern times. And, and if you do think that there is a space for such improvement, I invite you to take it up with the relevant council or the POC, um, where these standards and systems are discussed and, and updated. And, and I'm sure they will gladly take it up and discuss it. Only uh, speak to the specific standards and, uh, and what was set 20 years ago. Um, I'm still, I hope, too young to remember all of that. But um, certainly, as you say, it, it, it took off in Denmark, right? So why did it take off there and not in other countries? And I think I, I tried to touch a little bit on it, which was to say, I think in many ways Danish society has been highly digitized for a long time. So I think we had uh, an, elect an electronic ID in place. Uh, we had unique identifiers. Uh, we uh, we had the infrastructure to really enable this digital post system. And I think that at that point in time probably wasn't as readily available in, in all countries as it was in the, in the Nordics in particular. And that's probably why it, it took off earlier there. I think now we're at a stage where that is readily available. Uh, so uh, internet penetration is super high in, in most countries, right? More and more places, uh, they do have a digital ID. You see uh, EIDAS, the EU initiative to, to, to deliver uh, digital IDs, digital wallets that you can credentialize yourself with. So there's legislation now uh, pushing uh, the technology towards building the foundation needed for this uh, now. So was it too early 20 years ago? Apparently for some countries, uh, for some it wasn't. Uh, but I think we're, we're getting to the point now where it's, it's about time for everyone. Yes. <clears throat> Even though I'm very old, I don't remember <laughs> what the hell Walter was doing 20 years ago or what the systems were 20 years ago. Um, from our perspective, the, with Geomain, it's an opportunity to address the requirements of the digitally literate sub-25 year old in part, right? Who wants to be able to share his location uh, selectively, 
uh, with his friends, with his family, be able to get things delivered, be able to send things to places in an easy format and use it in, 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 some, in some basis that his familiarity, whether that be like WhatsApp, but a location-centric, you know, messaging system. Oh, that's interesting. Or a one-stop shop, here I am, for all of his other applications, whether that be ride-hailing, whether it be food delivery, without having to go, oh, God, where am I again? Just one stop. That's, that's what we see. And I would suggest that perhaps the technology that was around, both that that was provided and the platforms at which it was offered, um, maybe they were ahead of their time. But now we've got more power in our, our phones than they had when they flew to the moon. You know, it's all available and uh, there's a demand for it. And uh, I think that it now, is the, now is the opportunity to build loyalty with new communities and um, to be able to, for, for operators to, to consider offering such a solution out to marketplaces that have maybe viewed Post as a bit on the nose, a bit old fashioned, a bit old fuddy duddy. What does Post do for me? Hey guys, you have a whole new audience out there that would like to have a more easy way of communicating their location. Let's go to it and get communicating with them and like age of 16 and with uh, the post in, in Switzerland, you've got a captive community that you'll have for life. Go get them. Thank you. Okay, so we're at the end of our session today. Did anyone else have any questions that they wanted to ask before we close out and, uh, and appreciate our panelists here? Okay, ready for drinks, I suppose. Um, thank you guys so much for the discussion. I think this is such an interesting topic that we could sit here and talk about for a while. So uh, for me, the time went by really fast and thank you for that. Um, tomorrow we're back in here. Uh, Bernard will be uh, uh, moderating the sessions tomorrow. We are talking about trust and security um, as well as sustainability. So uh, more interesting topics to come tomorrow. Same format, talking about the vision in the morning and then diving deeper into the strategies in the afternoon. So I uh, hope to see you back here tomorrow and thank you everyone and thank you to the panelists. Thank you. <laughs>